Hi, everybody, and welcome to REN's webinar series. This is our sixth webinar today, March 1st. Today's subject is monitoring bat activity offshore. And before we begin, I just wanted to give a preview to anybody who is joining us that hasn't joined a previous webinar, just to provide an overview of what REN is. REN is working together to resolve environmental effects of wind energy. It was established in October of 2012, and since then, um, like I said, this is our sixth webinar. It, they typically occur every quarter. They are meant to facilitate international collaboration that advances global understanding of environmental effects. Colin, if you could change the slide to the next slide. And it covers both offshore and land-based wind energy development. And it's meant to also create a, and sh a, create a shared global network knowledge base, a community of practice of sorts on research, monitoring, and management for wind energy development. Next slide, please. Typically, the webinars attract between 60 and 80 unique callers. All of the webinar presentations are available on the TIES website, and the URL is, is available. There's been several different topics um, in the past about research, monitoring, methodologies, and results, similar to what you will hear today. And we have a couple of ideas going forward, and we'd like to invite participants to send us their ideas for future webinars. The next one will most likely be around the June time frame, so we, we continue on a quarterly basis. Next slide, Colin, please. Today's webinar on monitoring bat activity offshore, we have two speakers. Our first speaker is Trevor Peterson from Stantec Consulting Services, Incorporated. Our next two speakers will be Sander Lagerveld, from the Netherlands Institute of Marine Resources and Ecosystem Studies with Martin Plateau uh, with the Netherlands Ministry of Infrastructure and Environment. They'll um, present on their methods and results um, of their bat detection that they have been conducting over multiple years. Next slide, Colin. So to, before we begin, I'd just like to introduce you a little bit more to our speakers and then provide you some contact information if you'd like to um, supply some ideas for future webinar topics. Um, but to begin, um, Trevor Peterson is a senior wildlife biologist. He has been with Stantec since 2003, and today he will be providing a high-level summary of methods and results of a long-term regional survey of bat activity at remote islands, offshore structures, and coastal sites. Following Trevor's presentation, we will have um, some time for some Q&A specific to his presentation, and then we will move on to our, our second presentation. Um, it will be Sander Lagerfeld and Martin Plateau. They will present research on the, of research in the North Sea off the western coast of the Netherlands, where they have 12 bat recorders installed at several points offshore and they will present preliminary results of, of their bat detection. With that, um, Colin, would you go to the, my last slide before Trevor begins? And here we have contact information for Karen Sinclair at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, Andrea Coping at Pacific National Laboratory, and Jocelyn Brown Sociano with the Department of Energy. And with that, we, we are happy that you were here. And um, please, please welcome our first speaker, Trevor Peterson. OK. Um, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here today. I'm excited to be talking about a, a research project that we've been involved in since 2009. And this presentation is essentially a summary. And on the one hand, it's essentially a summary of the report that we've recently completed, which is now available um, through the TEPES website, and I'll, I'll have a link to that report at the end of this presentation. And most of the content of, of my slides is also found within that report with, with 
more detailed explanation. Um, but what I'd like to do today with, with the time we have here is talk through some of the high-level summaries, some of the major findings of this long-term monitoring, and then touch briefly at the end on what the implications might be for, for offshore wind development in these areas we monitored, and then some, some ideas of potential methods to, to manage potential impacts. So the, the overall things I'd like to cover again are the approach and methods that we use for this monitoring. The results focusing on you know, where and when do bats occur offshore, and then lastly the implications for offshore wind. So the first thing to, to really emphasize about monitoring bats offshore is that in, in many cases it's actually impossible. The definition of offshore that we're, that I'd that I'm using throughout this presentation and throughout our analysis is water that's beyond three nautical miles from land. This is the definition that the Bureau of Ocean Energy and Mining and Management uses to, to define this area. So it's basically three miles from land. And it's awfully difficult to put any equipment out in such a place, particularly in the areas we were surveying, which are the Gulf of Maine, the Mid-Atlantic, and the Great Lakes. There's not a lot of infrastructure out there to monitor that activity. So what we did as, as an approach beginning back in 2009 was to select sites that we felt would represent what bats might be doing in the open ocean and specifically looking at remote offshore structures where they are present, remote islands, and then as a last resort, coastal sites if we couldn't find any suitable islands to, on which to deploy equipment. And I have the, the picture of the puff in there is, is sort of a theme that will carry through my presentation. Obviously, it's not a bat, but in Maine, at least, we have a number of islands that support puffin colonies turn out to be pretty convenient places to deploy acoustic bat detectors. We attempted to select sites that were at a gradient of distances and degrees of isolation from the mainland. So some sites were close to the mainland, some were quite far, and we quantified this distance, and we also quantified the amount of land within three nautical miles of each monitoring site. And then lastly, recognizing that we were in fact monitoring activity on land, in most cases on islands, we wanted to account for the role that the habitat of these sites might have in affecting the results. So the metric that we used in our analysis was the percent of forested habitat within a certain distance, I believe it was 100 meters of the detectors. So as an example of one of the sites we monitored, this is uh, Matinicus Rock, which is kind of our classic type of isolated island we use. It's again, it's one of the few puffin colonies in, in the Gulf of Maine, and it's about 30 kilometers nearest mainland location. The, the island itself lacks trees. It has, you know, some herbaceous vegetation, but nothing that would typically be thought of as bat habitat, except possibly the lighthouse itself. Um, if you're familiar with the kid's story, Keep the Lights Burning Abbey or We Peter Puffin, this is the place where those stories took place. And it turns out that there's actually some historical accounts from places like this of bats being observed in the fall. So we selected this as well as a number of other sites in the Gulf of Maine in 2009 to do a pilot study of you know, just how often do bats show up at these places. Um, that study was later funded by the Department of Energy and continued for a period of six years expanding into the Mid-Atlantic and Great Lakes. So today's presentation will include a summary of all of the data we collected over that period. Our overall approach at each of these sites was to deploy acoustic bat detectors on a focal point. Essentially, we're trying to get as high as possible above the ground so that we could sample bat activity in you know, the airspace where wind turbines would be operating. There's a lot of, there's not much infrastructure out there that we can get that high, but lighthouses prove to be a pretty convenient place to deploy equipment. All of our sites included at least one, usually a pair of, of acoustic bat detectors when we used almost exclusively this zero crossing style of anabat detector, which is, is convenient for long-term deployment because they can operate autonomously for a long period of time. Occasionally, we were able to download data remotely, but most of these sites had to operate all by themselves for a period of, in some cases, over 12 months and store all of the data locally. So these were all powered by solar panels and batteries, 
and the uh, you can see at the lower left the little PVC elbow is used commonly used to reflect the bat calls into the microphone while protecting the detector from the weather. So the setup was virtually identical at all sites that we monitored. And this is a map of the locations we monitored in the Gulf of Maine at some point during the study. And, and the color and size of the icon indicates the number of years um, we monitored each site. Um, some of the sites we used, we, uh, the, the most remote would be these weather buoys, which were between a couple kilometers and up to about 15 kilometers from the mainland. Lighthouses, again, were, were, are common in the Gulf of Maine, and many of our sites were deployed on lighthouses. And to get to all of these sites, we really relied on a lot of different help. In this case, you know, an elementary school class in one of the islands helped put a detector up in a tree on, on the southern end of their island. So we found tremendous support and interest in this topic from a variety of places. In the Great Lakes, the detectors were a little bit more dispersed. We had four sites in Lake Superior um, and then two sites along Lake Erie. We had a third site in Lake Erie, but we never obtained valid data from that site. So we, the Toledo light at the west end of Lake Erie um, was the only site we monitored where, where the equipment failed to operate properly at any point. And again, most of these sites in the Great Lakes were lighthouses. This is Rock of Ages light on the west end of Isle Royal in Lake Superior. Another lighthouse on the tip of the Keweenaw Peninsula in Lake Superior. And this lower left or lower right is, is Presque Isle State Park along the coast in Pennsylvania. So again, similar types of infrastructure in the Great Lakes. And then lastly, the Mid-Atlantic, there were eight sites. Um, from Cape Hamilton, Delaware, down to Ocracoke Light on the North Carolina coast. And we had a, a fair number of structures. This is the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel, where we were able to deploy equipment. The Chesapeake Light Tower and, and uh, navigational aid. So we were opportunistic in where we deployed equipment, but again, it represents a wide range of, of locations and degrees of isolation. Just showing the distribution of sites relative to their distance, the upper graph shows the number of sites according to distance from the mainland in kilometers. And you can see most of the sites uh, are you know, between zero to 10 kilometers from the mainland. A few, um, four sites, I guess, greater than 30 kilometers. So again, there's, there's a spectrum of distance there, but a, a concentration of sites relatively close to the mainland. And then on the lower panel shows the proportion of forest within 100 meters of the detectors. And this, this is, again, demonstrating that there's a wide range of forest. In, in most cases, though, there was not a lot of forest canopy, less than 10% of the area within 100 meters of the detectors had any trees. I'll be reporting a number of different metrics of acoustic activity. Um, many of these we calculated during a standardized period of mid-July through mid-October, limiting sites to those with more than 30 nights in this period. And the reason for this is metrics like passes, passes per night are dramatically affected by the season during which we're monitoring. And we tried to standardize those methods, those metrics, when we're making comparisons among sites. In cases where we were able to monitor for an entire year, you know, January 1st through December 31st, there's a lot of period there when we did not detect activity. However, that's to be expected during winter time and so forth. So in certain places, we report all of the data. In others, we limit it to a standardized set for reporting. Um, the three primary metrics that we used in our analysis are this activity level, the number of bat tests per night. The second is the percent of nights within this period during which at least one bat was detected. And then lastly, there's a, a coefficient known as the Gini coefficient, which is a measure of the evenness of activity among nights. And this goes from zero, which would be completely uniform, the same number of passes recorded every night, to one, which would indicate that all of the activity occurred on one night. And the reason we did this was to get a sense of, of how consistent activity was at the various sites we're monitoring. All of these metrics can be computed you know, for all bats combined or for individual species, and they report some results of each.
So this is a chart, and I don't want to dwell on this, but you'll find this in the copy. This is simply showing the distribution of effort over the over the year. So it's the number of sites that we were monitoring by week throughout the year. And you can see that there are a few sites that we were able to monitor all year, but the bulk of our monitoring really occurred between mid-July and mid mid-October to, to late mid October to mid November really we had quite a lot of monitoring going on. In some cases as many as fifteen sites being monitored simultaneously in the Gulf of Maine. Effort was obviously a little bit lower in the Mid-Atlantic and Great Lakes, but we did have consistently more than five sites being monitored in the Mid-Atlantic and Great Lakes throughout at least two to three monitoring periods. The Gulf of Maine is the only site where we have monitoring for up to six years. Um, so jumping along to the results, uh, the question of when and where are bats detected? The quick answer is everywhere, but not often. We did detect bats at every site we monitored at some point during the monitoring period. Not necessarily every year, but at least one bat was detected at every site. However, most of the time, most nights sampled, there is no bat activity happening. This bottom graph essentially shows that 59% you know, of all surveyed nights that we monitored, there were no patches detected. And, and this isn't necessarily unexpected, but it, it's a, a very common pattern for this kind of acoustic activity. So despite the fact that there was widespread presence, the amount of presence and the consistency was relatively low. Overall, we recorded over a half million bat passes, each of which was consisted of at least two echolocation pulses of a bat. And the activity levels were highly variable among sites. So between zero to nearly 50,000 passes per site for in a, any given year of monitoring. Um, overall, the metrics we use of the number of passes per night between mid-July and mid-October ranged from less than one to over 300 among sites. So again, highly variable activity. However, very consistent seasonal patterns across the board. Um, and I'll be showing these later, but Primarily, offshore bat presence or presence at remote islands appears to be a migratory phenomenon. I'll skip through some of these relatively quickly, but I wanted to show an example of the degree of how, how consistent bat activity was among certain sites. So this is a snapshot of some of the sites in the Gulf of Maine. The numbers indicate the number of nights surveyed within the reporting period, and then the percent is the percent of nights with activity. So Matinicus Rock was the site that I showed you at the beginning. Of the 351 nights we surveyed within the mid-July to mid-October time period, at least one bat was detected during 42% of those nights. So again, this is a remote island 30 plus kilometers from the mainland. I think that number was higher than what we would have expected going into this study. Similarly, at some of the buoys we, we monitored, you can see um, over 30% in some cases of nights with bat activity at these structures. Similar pictures in the Great Lakes between uh, you know, 90 to 100 percent in many cases of nights surveyed had bat activity, particularly at these sites more close to the coasts. In the Mid-Atlantic, again, pretty consistent numbers of, uh, not necessarily consistent, but relatively high numbers of the percent of nights with activity. The lowest number here, you can see the Chesapeake Light Towers, purple dot near the top. 15% of nights sampled had activity within that July to October time period. We also had several monitoring detectors on NOAA research vessels that were, that were making outings throughout the Gulf of Maine and throughout the Mid-Atlantic. Um, we, ha we had a lot of equipment failure on these data sets, but the, the last voyage of one, of the, one particular ship um, cruised around the Mid-Atlantic Outer Continental Shelf in mid-September, and we were able to document that activity out to 130 kilometers from the mainland on several occasions. This, the when the question of, of when bets are active is a, is a little bit more com complicated, but primarily it's an August-September phenomenon. This coincides with the migratory period for many bats in this part of the world. This is again a view of the results from Matinicus Rock showing the annual trends and percent of nights of activity on the top and the passes per detector night on the bottom. And it's a pretty consistent bump in August, September, and October among years. 
this pattern was, was observed essentially throughout the regions we monitored. So this is now showing the combined results at the Great Lakes at the top, Gulf of Maine in the middle, and the mid-Atlantic. And this is showing both the, the number of passes per month on a species-specific basis. And you can see certainly there's a difference in the number of, of uh, the amount of activity among species. But again, for most species, this relatively consistent pattern of activity during October, during August and September, and relatively little activity during other year. This is a different view, again, looking at the regional basis and the percent nights with activity as opposed to the number of passives. And you see the same consistent pattern. Um, note that the, the number on the, the x-axis or the y-axis, in many cases for certain species, we're getting activity during, you know, 60 percent of nights within a particular month. So th again, there's quite a lot of activity going on in August and September. One data set that I think deserves a little bit more focus is the, the 1,600 nights of data we collected at weather buoys, and among this group of data, we, we recorded bats during 15 percent of nights within the July to October period. And the range varied quite a bit among buoys between 1 to 57 percent of nights with activity at these buoys. Most of the activity was either red bats, that was about 73 percent of passes we recorded at buoys, or hoary bats. And this pattern was true of most of our data from remote offshore structures. The migratory bats were were the most commonly detected species. And, and again, these three, three species I'll show pictures of first are, are the long distance migratory species as opposed to cave hibernating species. These travel relatively long distances. We don't know exactly far, how far um, throughout the northeast and, and also along the coast. And they do not hibernate. So they, they do seasonal migration similar to songbirds and they're most commonly or most frequently observed during the fall migratory period. So the eastern red bat, and here's a picture of the echolocation calls that we use to identify these. The silver-haired bat, and the hoary bat. This is the largest bat that, that lives in, in our study area. However, in addition to those migratory species, we also detected um, members of the myota species genus um, at most of our, at even in the most remote sites. So these are the smallest bats that we have in the region, and they were appearing out at sites like Matinicus Rock, at buoys, at our most remote sites as well. So one of the big focuses of our analysis was to figure out the degree, the effect of isolation on sites and what that effect might have on activity levels. And so our report contains a number of, of model results where we fit um, linear models to the three metrics of that activity that I mentioned, so the number of passes per night, the percent of nights, and the Gini coefficient. And all of those metrics showed an essentially similar pattern. That Activity levels, by whichever metric you use, decrease with site isolation. And site isolation measured as in terms of distance from the mainland was the most prominent measure of isolation. Um, so this graph, the three, the three panels on the top show the relationship between the passes per detector night with distance. And then the three on the bottom show the relationship, the effect of the percent forest. So you can see there's, there's sort of opposing effects very similar effect size, both significant, with isolation causing a decrease in the amount of activity and the amount of forest causing a corresponding increase. So it's important to take into account the characteristics of the sites when assessing site isolation if you're not able to control them through, through monitoring on, on only the same type of structures, for example. If you look instead at the percent of nights with activity, the relationships are, again, the same with, with percent forest and distance from mainland having roughly equal and opposite effects. And lastly, with the Gini coefficient, you have the same story. The activity becomes much less consistent as you get further from shore. And again, less consistent activity is indicated by a Gini coefficient closer to one. And again, all of these graphs are, are in the report and explained further. So, so uh, I just wanted to show them for, for the context here. 
if you look at these same metrics on a species-specific level, you do see significant differences in the effect of isolation among species. I, I didn't include the error of the models in this figure just to keep it a little clearer, but focus on, for a moment, on the big brown bats, which is the bright red line, um, and then silver-haired bats, which is the orange line. And if you can see the colors, the, the orange line is, is the flattest among the regions in terms of the number of passes as well as the percent nights of activity, whereas the red line is quite steep. So this is indicating the behavioral differences. Big ground bats, for example, are, are very commonly detected at terrestrial sites and very commonly detected along the coast, but very rarely detected at any of the offshore sites, whereas silver-haired bats were essentially equally common at the more remote sites, remote islands, and offshore structures. Oddly enough, myota species were also not particularly affected by distance, although this could be subject the result of a few influential outliers in the data set. Uh, the number of passes per, per site get a little thin when you're looking at species-specific results in some cases, but I think it's important to consider the fact that, that there are definitely different species effects of isolation among species. The other type of analysis that we were focusing on is, is trying to establish what conditions bats were active under offshore. And to address that, we used, in, in, the, in this particular analysis, we used pooled uh, current of bats as a, as a percent of hours monitored with activity versus average nightly wind speed and average nightly temperature on a regional basis. And so what these plots show is, you know, given the availability of, of conditions, bat activity was more, was higher during the calmer, warmer period. So the lighter colors indicate greater percents of hours with activity. So when you, when you pull all the data on a regional basis, you do see this concentration of activity when temperatures are warmer and wind speeds are lower. And this is certainly in line with, with typical results in our understandings of bat biology. Um, but it's, it's interesting to see that you can you can see these patterns on a large scale. And the conditions during which bats are active, active really set up the potential implications for offshore wind. Uh, essentially, if you have presence of bats, there, there is some potential for risk. The magnitude is very, is, cannot be predicted with acoustic data, but you can determine the types of conditions bats are active. Based on our data, the degree of isolation has an opposite effect with risk. So the more isolated a particular site is from the mainland, presumably the lower the risk of potential impacts to bats. This risk certainly varies seasonally based on the seasonal patterns and activity, and the level of risk likely varies with conditions. Oops. So at the beginning, when I mentioned that offshore really lacks any sort of bat habitat, I think it's important to think about the fact that the air itself serves as, as critical habitat for bats and a very dynamic portion of their habitat. The, the consistency of the air, the conditions in the air, dramatically affects the suitability of, of this part of their habitat for bats in terms of prey availability, in terms of mechanics of flight and energetics of flight. And I think it's good to think about you know, the variability in these conditions particularly offshore, and how that might affect the distribution of activity. And the area of research that, that I'm interested in pursuing, building out of this, this research, is to look at the availability of conditions offshore. And, and this is showing a, a heat map. Essentially, it's a contour map of the amount of time with particular wind speeds on the, the x-axis and temperatures on the y-axis that are available at a particular site. Again, this is the sample from Matinicus Rock during the survey period. So you can see there's quite a lot of time with wind speeds between approximately 5 to 12 meters per second at temperatures all the way from 2 to 20 degrees Celsius. If you overlay on top of this, when the conditions during which bats were actually active, you can see it's a very small subset of available conditions. In this case, most bat activity was concentrated during times when the wind was approximately 5 meters second or less, and temperatures were relatively warm. 
I think this type of approach is a useful way of looking at, if you think of, of conditions in the airspace as habitat, the sort of habitat preferences of bats when they're in a particular habitat, in a particular site. So I, I'm interested in doing this analysis among the various sites that we monitored to see how consistent this pattern might be across sites and whether it's notably different at remote islands versus offshore structures versus um, terrestrial sites. So to wrap up here, and I want to make sure to leave plenty of time for questions, um, our, our results certainly indicate that bats do occur offshore on a seasonally predictable basis. The amount of degree of isolation of sites certainly affects their activity, with more isolated sites having less lower levels of activity. The magnitude of, of the number of bats off at these sites is very difficult to assess with acoustics, and hence the magnitude of potential risks are also harder to predict with acoustics. However, you can use these data to identify the highest risk conditions and generate you know, metrics and methods to, to manage potential risk. The, the copy of our final report summarizing these results is available at the UR, URL indicated below. And um, I encourage everybody to go download that report. It's, it's hot off the press and, and has quite a lot of detail on all of these metrics, as well as summaries of the results for each individual site. Um, Briefly, I want to acknowledge the many different organizations that helped us with logistics, as well as obviously the Department of Energy for, for the funding for the research. And with that, I think there's time for questions now, and as I'll be on the uh, remainder of the webinar as well for questions at the end. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Trevor. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Luke Hanna with Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. I'm just going to be fielding a couple of questions. Um, just as a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the notes tab in the bottom right-hand corner um, to ask any questions. So we have a couple questions coming in, Trevor. Um, uh, one question is whether or not you have any data or understanding on the flight height of these bats and where they were uh, detected offshore. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Flight height is difficult to assess with acoustics. We can only record a bat when it's within approximately 30 meters of the detector. Our detectors were positioned horizontally, so you know, our, our ability to comment on height is really limited to the range where we could deploy detectors, and that was about you know a couple meters above the surface to the greatest would have been approximately 30 maybe 40 meters above above the water level. So we know that bats are at least that high, but these data don't really allow a great detail of the flight heights. Some of the anecdotal reports, some of the actual visual analysis that others have done with, with high-definition cameras suggest that there are bats that are flying quite high. Um, and obviously some of the work that, similar work at, at terrestrial wind farms demonstrate that they're flying at on the height, at least, of turbines, but our data don't really provide much indication of flight height. Okay. Thank you. Um, given that some species of bats appear to be attracted to land-based wind turbines, what are your thoughts on how they might behave uh, at or around offshore uh, turbines that are located in the offshore environment? Right. This is, I think, a really important question in trying to understand potential impacts offshore. Any, any potential attraction could certainly occur offshore, and I think it's, it's reasonable that it might happen. And, and also the role of attraction could, is important to consider when, when interpreting the results of our monitoring. By monitoring on islands, for example, bats could be using these islands as migratory stopovers. They might, they might be known landmarks for the bats. Wind turbines and other offshore structures probably wouldn't serve as a you know, known stopover, but they could certainly be a sensory attractant. You know, a bat flying along could see them at a relatively good distance. And I guess some of the, the paradox of attraction offshore is that when there's essentially zero habitat other than structures and islands, there might be a greater degree of attraction going on. At the same time, presumably there are fewer bats overall present offshore. 
so it's, there's kind of opposing forces, but I, I would certainly suspect that any mechanisms of attraction that are happening at terrestrial sites could certainly happen offshore as well. Sure. Okay. Um, let's see. So when, when bats were detected at island locations offshore, um, were you able to gain an understanding of whether or not they were roosting or hunting or were they just or whether they were just passing by during migration? Um, and then I guess kind of along those lines, um, you know, with the, the bat presence data that you were able to collect, were you able to identify any of uh, the primary migratory corridors or areas that were more commonly used by these bats than others? Yeah, so it's it's difficult with acoustics. You can't differentiate individual bats. The, the best way we can assess whether bats are foraging versus simply passing by is to look look at measures such as how how many hours during a particular night was their activity, or for example, where their feeding buzz is recorded. We certainly have sites with with what I would call obvious foraging behavior. Uh, one particular example is, is an island off of Maine's coast, Seguin Island that consistently had you know, tens of thousands of eastern red bat calls each year. And when we dug a little deeper, we found that that lighthouse was actually constantly illuminated and probably serving as a, as a major moth attractant. And I suspect what's happening there, there were a few resident bats flying around and around repeatedly um, based on you know, feeding buzzes and so forth, and the, just the complete consistency of results. In other cases where we would have weeks without any bad activity at all, and a sudden pulse of activity on a particular night followed by additional weeks without activity, that's more indica indicative in my mind of a stopover or, or potentially even a one individual bat or a small number of bats passing by an area. So you have to really make some assumptions about what the data represent and, and try to tease out those behavioral things. I certainly suspect that there's migratory stopovers going on in some of these cases, but it's really hard to, to demonstrate that for sure with these data. And, and can you repeat the second part of the question? Because I know I had, I didn't quite get there yet. Yeah, sure. It's, it's basically just getting at whether or not, you know, I know it's, it's, it's hard to uh, use use this data to get a specific location on the bats, but whether or not you were able to begin to kind of tease out any migratory corridors uh, oh, right. for, for, these, for these bats in, in these larger areas. I know it's, it's obviously not going to be a very specific area, but... Right. Uh, my personal opinion with, in terms of migratory corridors for bats, at least in the regions we were monitoring, is that I, I don't... Well, I don't really think that they exist per se. I, I think on a very large scale, they, they, they certainly do. But I think on a, on a smaller scale, what we've seen is more, more indicative of sort of a broad front, widespread migration of bats through a region rather than following particular routes. Certainly, if you were to think of, of for example, the Gulf of Maine, I don't think we can identify, based on our data, individual places within the Gulf of Maine at least offshore, that have more or less fat activity. I think on a broad scale, the coast serves as, as somewhat of a concentrated concentration of migration. The highest passage rates we saw were along the coast. That could be explained by a number of factors, but it, it's difficult to say based on our acoustic data that there's one particular area with a lot more bats than another. And, and this is true also of land-based projects. When virtually anywhere you put up a bat detector, during the fall, you will see migratory silverhead bats, hoary bats, and red bats coming through, whether that's on a you know, forested ridge line, a remote island, or a, or a beach along the coast. And, and we're, it, it, it's harder than you would think to identify you know, zones with a lot more bat activity. They do appear to be quite widespread, and, that, and that's certainly supported by mortality data from wind farms, too, whether you're in you know, agricultural landscapes in the Midwest or forested ridges in the Northeast. The timing and species composition and mortality are, are quite similar. Okay. Well, thank you, Trevor. Um, we're not getting any more questions at the moment, but I think uh, maybe we should move on to Sander and Martin's presentation. Thank you much. 
Hi, everybody. Can you uh, hear us? Yes, we can. Okay, all right. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Sander Lagerfeld, and uh, working at uh, Maris. My name is Martin Popel, working for uh, the Dutch uh, government, Dijkswaterstaat, Ministry of uh, Infrastructure and Environment. And we would like to uh, present on um, uh, the results of uh, uh, bat uh, migration studies, which have been done uh, during the last years at the southern North Sea of the Dutch coast, and uh, possible implications for um, offshore wind farms. Uh, in this slide, you can see uh, a beautiful sunset at the beach, but uh, what you also can see is that there is a well, you can, <laughs> it's rather small, but there is a, a nuptial, nuptial, which is uh, migrating over sea. Um, and after a short introduction, we would like to present the results of uh, uh, pilot studies from uh, 2012 until 14, and uh, a more extensive monitoring program in 2015 and 16. Uh, then we would like to summarize the current knowledge um, of that in relation to the development of offshore wind energy. And we would like to uh, uh, finish with some conclusions and options for future research. Uh, well, in fact, since quite some time, we know that bats occur over the North Sea. There have been numerous uh, records of individuals on offshore platforms and ships uh, and remote islands like the Faroe Islands or Heligoland. But also there have been numerous observations during uh, bird surveys at sea and from uh, uh, bird watchers who do uh, migration count, counts at the coast who regularly see bats coming in from sea. Um, and we also know that, uh, uh, that there is regular offshore bat activity uh, at the Baltic Sea and off the Pacific and Atlantic coast of North America. Um, this is the distribution map of Natusius pipistrelle. This is a uh, well, small bat. Uh, European bat, a long distance migrant which uh, travels up to 2,000 kilometers between the um, summer areas in northern and eastern Europe and the winter areas in southern and western Europe. Uh, presumably their main uh, migration routes, routes are located along the Baltic coast, uh, along the Dutch and Belgium coast south of France, and it's also suspected that they migrate over sea from Norway to the UK, but uh, when this map was made, it was not known that there is also regular migration from uh, the Netherlands or Western Europe to the UK. Um, and since uh, a few years, it's also known that there are uh, banded individuals which have crossed the North Sea. Uh, during uh, 2012 until 2014, there have been uh, several pilot studies done. Uh, in 2014, uh, monitoring was done at four different locations. One at the beach at uh, Egmond aan Zee. Egmond aan Zee is a small village about uh, 40 kilometers from Amsterdam uh, at the, uh, well, at the coast. Um, uh, another uh, detector was uh, installed at offshore wind farm, Egmond aan Zee, some 15 kilometers from the coast. Uh, another one at Princess Amalia wind farm, 23 kilometers from the coast. And the last one at uh, a meteorological mast uh, around 85 kilometers from the coast, uh, about uh, halfway between the Netherlands and the UK. 
Um, what you see here is a, a, a figure of the uh, results at Egmond aan Zee. On the x-axis you see the, uh, well, the months. So we, uh, from March until uh, late October. Uh, the, the pink uh, part uh, during that time uh, we were not monitoring. Uh, you can see here that, well, we had a problem with the detector in autumn. And uh, what you also can see is that the detector is switched off during the day. The gray uh, area is the period of uh, darkness throughout the season. And, uh, what, and the, the dots, they represent the presence in a certain time interval. In this case, we choose uh, a 10-minute interval and the different colors of the dots represent different species. So um, we have uh, here at this location both uh, resident species, like, uh, for example, uh, Daubertons bat, uh, noctule, or, uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, pond bat, and common pipistrelle, and uh, Migratory species like um, Natusius pipistrelle and Noctule. But Noctule also uh, occurs as a, uh, a resident uh, near the coast. Uh, what you see is that the bed activity is, well, uh, well uh, occurs throughout the season. You don't see a, a real uh, seasonal pattern. But when you look at the offshore wind farm Egmond aan Zee, 15 kilometers from the coast, the, 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 the picture changes dramatically. Uh, what you see here is uh, a seasonal pattern. Most activity uh, from late August uh, throughout September, and the red dots do represent the migratory Natusius pipistrel. You also see some Natusius uh, in spring, but less uh, frequently. Um, and in addition, there are some uh, uh, records uh, in the summer months of the resident common pipistrel. Uh, furthermore, what you can see is that most activity occurs in autumn between two and six hours out after dark, more or less. And um, in spring, you see that bats um, occur very late in the night at this location or immediately after dark. So this is the location a little bit more uh, uh, far further from the coast, about 23 kilometers, and basically you see the same pattern. So the main activity in autumn occurs from two until six hours after dark. Uh, at this location we could not uh, obtain um, uh, results in spring, unfortunately. In this graph, you see the results of um, uh, the Eimuiden uh, meteorological mast, 85 kilometers from the coast. And what you see here is that um, in autumn, the bats arrive, well, more or less between uh, five hours after dark until nine hours after dark, or immediately after dark what you see here. And in fact, what you see in these four different graphs is uh, a shift in activity which occurs from east to west. So apparently, they move from east to west in autumn and 
in the opposite direction in spring because here the activity occurs uh, earlier in the night than at always, which is closer to the coast. And furthermore, what you see is that bed activity regularly starts immediately after dark. And that can mean only one thing, that they stay there during the day. Well, um, because of these intriguing results from the preliminary survey from only uh, from four parts in only one year, 2014, because the other years we only obtained results from two things, uh, the government, the Dutch government, decided that it was interesting to find out more about intensity and possible migration routes across the North Sea in order to find out how to manage spatial planning of wind farms, etc. So uh, for 2015 and the, this upcoming year, 2016, we want to monitor, have monitored on 12 different locations at different distances from the coast. Um, additional to the three uh, or four sites we have reported on before. Um, here in, on this map, where we see the, the United Kingdom with Norwich and Ipswich on the western side and the Dutch and Belgian coast on the eastern side, we have two Belgian uh, sites and we have uh, 10 uh, Dutch sites. We'll now <clears throat> we have not yet obtained uh, all results nor elaborated them from all, these, all of these uh, observation points but we'll show some of the results of a little bit of a similar gradient, a little bit more to the south from Europe platform uh, as the most offshore point, Gure in the middle, and the coastal point at Hoek van Holland. At Hoek van Holland we see, a ve uh, we, we also missed uh, the spring, but we see a very uh, wide, wide scale uh, the scale of, of uh, species involved, and they are present throughout the season and throughout the night and involving all different species with a clear um, predominance of the migratory Nathusius pipis trail in September and October. It's uh, remarkable that they seem to be a little bit later here, or at least in this year at Hoek van Holland, than they were in the previous year further north. At 30 kilometers offshore, we see a lot less uh, animals. Here we have installed uh, the monitoring already by April, May, and you see a very similar pattern to the 2014 uh, data from Egmont uh, region. But again, most of the data were a little bit later in the season in autumn. And the Euro platform, at uh, 50 kilometers, only very few data were uh, uh, gathered. Unfortunately, uh, we uh, had no operation in April, May, neither had we in late September and October. That might cause some of the uh, scarcity of, uh, of bad uh, records. Uh, remarkable are two records uh, in mid-June, out, out with any of the migration season, involving both uh, nictaloid, noctule, and uh, Methusius pipistrel. Well, I'll let uh, my colleague again. Yeah, we, we also um, looked at um, uh, the data in relation to the weather conditions, and we can show you some preliminary results because we are not done yet with this uh, analysis. Uh, we only included uh, data of Natusius pipistrel, uh, the most uh, common species at sea, and we only used uh, data obtained in offshore wind farm Egmond aan Zee uh, in the period of 22 August until the 10th of October. Uh, we obtained weather data from an offshore location 
uh, 75 kilometers from the coast, and also weather data from uh, a coastal location. And we looked at the weather parameters, uh, wind speed, wind direction, humidity, cloud cover, visibility, temperature, atmospheric pressure, and precipitation. Preliminary results show that uh, weather conditions at sea are a better predictor, uh, are better predictors than those on land. Uh, and relevant weather parameters are wind speed, wind direction, and visibility. Uh, there might, uh, we didn't include uh, the factor, uh, the availability of insects, uh, because, well, we don't know uh, that yet. But some researchers have suggested that, uh, in fact, uh, the migration of uh, bats might be linked to the availab availability of insects on the way. So it is possible that we are now, in fact, looking at uh, the weather parameters which trigger insects migration instead of uh, weather parameters that actually triggered bat migration. Um, what you can see here is that um, uh, in this graph we fitted a, a GAM through uh, the data points uh, in relation to wind speed. And what you see here is that uh, almost all bat activity occurs at wind speeds uh, less than uh, 7 meters per second. And also, bad activity is strongly linked to wind directions between northeast and southeast. So they have, when they are at sea, they have tailwinds in autumn. Yeah. Um, and in addition to that, it seems that uh, bad activity uh, uh, is associated with a, a good uh, visibility visibility over eight kilometers. Well, that's an offshore wind farm. We suggest that they might be attracted to the offshore structures in the first place, either because they find better uh, insect availability or because they are uh, illuminated or whatever. But it is not possible to demonstrate it by our data because we have only measured close to offshore, offshore structures. There is a possible link, as Sandra has suggested already, with insect availability at sea, but we didn't measure that either. It is rather clear that even if there is no possible, no attraction to offshore structures, they do occur there, and that uh, implies that there are risks for collision and or barotrauma of flying bats close to rotating uh, blades of wind turbines and that they might, uh, they might be at risk there. We haven't got the faintest idea how large a population or how large a part of proportion of the population will be at risk, but uh, it, risks cannot be excluded. Fatalities are likely. And we've also seen by the data that it's mostly migratory species like the Nathusias pipistrelle and to a lesser extent the noctules that are at risk. Well, population effects cannot be excluded for at least the most numerous species, the Nathusias pipistrelle, but we just don't know how many Nathusias pipistrelles there are and how large a proportion is uh, crossing the North Sea and how large a proportion of those that are crossing the North Sea are actually um, at risk in current or futurely planned offshore wind farms. But bats are relevant in spatial planning, so you have to take them into account in planning where to put your wind farms, how many wind turbines you will raise there, and how to operate them. There is a possibility that it's suggested by the fact that most um, bat migration is detected at low wind speeds to mitigate, and in a very specific period of time, 
within the season to mitigate by increasing the cutting speed of the wind turbines in the most vulnerable period, being between late August and early October, during periods of low uh, easterly winds below seven meters per second. And it's soon to be raised offshore wind farm at Borsele, close to the Belgian border in the North Sea. We have already legally uh, included the mitigation measure of this increase in the cut-in speed in order to, uh, as a precautionary approach, using precautionary principle to mitigate possible fatalities for bats. And of course, we have to follow up research to address both the potential population effects, are we exaggerating, are we underestimating, and we have to really see through the effectiveness of mitigation measures. This is rather difficult stuff because even for birds, which are more, much easier to detect and et cetera, we do not really know yet. But we'll have to do a little bit more research on this stuff. In conclusion, um, yeah, we can say that uh, bats uh, regularly occur over the North Sea from late August until early October and less frequently in sp spring. Uh, their occurrence is uh, linked to uh, uh, weather conditions with uh, winds from the east at low wind speed and a high visibility. Uh, the species composition we uh, have observed and timing of occurrence indicate clearly migration, although in some occasions we've seen also some records during the summer, so in some occasions there might be uh, individuals from uh, resident local populations at the coast involved. Uh, Natusius pipistrel is by far the most common species at sea. Uh, on the right side, you see, you see a, uh, a picture of a roosting individual uh, at uh, the offshore wind farm uh, Egmont aan Zee. This photograph was taken by a service engineer. Uh, other species uh, which uh, occur offshore are common nocturnal, common pipistrelle, and probably party colored bat. Uh, in case of the Natusius pipistrelle, we see uh, an east-west migration in autumn and uh, the opposite direction in spring and quite uh, remarkable they seem to spend regularly the day at sea at the offshore, at the offshore structure. And what we think uh, what would be useful uh, in future uh, monitoring programs um, uh, would be uh, especially uh, to look at uh, eventually at the number of fatalities and you have to uh, model that probably so we have to develop a model which can predict the number of fatalities but we need a reli reliable input parameters and these parameters we probably can obtain those by uh, behavioral research uh, uh, with uh, thermal imaging cameras. Um, another uh, interesting option is uh, tracking and tracing of bats. So try to yeah, track them when they migrate over sea or when they fly around or uh, close to uh, wind turbines. And uh, the last uh, factor which would be very uh, uh, we, which can be very important is the availability of uh, insects over sea. Um, yeah, currently we are uh, trying to develop these uh, thermal imaging uh, uh, camera setup. Uh, it's, uh, it's a, yeah, well, it, it is technically uh, quite challenging, in fact, uh, especially. Um, um, uh, the, the triggering of the cameras, uh, synchronization of the cameras, and the calibration of the cameras. 
is a, is a challenge. But we are uh, well. We probably uh, managed to uh, to get it running. Uh, we didn't do uh, all the work presented here uh, by ourselves only. Here are the pa all the partners who are involved in this uh, project, either uh, doing the better technical work, or providing locations or logistic services, or uh, sponsors of the project. And thank you very much for uh, your attention. Do you have uh, any questions? Great, thank you both. That was a very, very interesting presentation. So it's very refreshing to hear what's going on with some of this new research overseas. Uh, we do have a couple questions, so I will um, ask you some of those. Um, so with regards to one of your first slides, um, where you showed uh, migration routes for some bats over there. Uh, there is a possibility that bats may not be using echo echolocation during migration. Uh, so could these data be considered a conservative level of activity? Um, yeah, well, it's possible that they, uh, that they do not uh, echolocation uh, oversee. Uh, on the other hand, uh, what you also see is that uh, bats sometimes uh, spend uh, quite some time at the offshore structure. So they mm -hmm. can also stay there, I know, two, uh, two, three, four hours. And then you yeah, record all these time intervals. Mm -hmm. And that is, yeah, might be causing an overestimate. Uh, right. Okay. What was the, the height of the detectors at the offshore wind and met mass sites that you used? Uh, approximately 15 meters. 15.15? Yeah. 15 meters. Yeah. Okay. And, and how long? I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, it's um, uh, well. What? what what has been uh, presented from Swedish research is that they, they say that bats always fly low over sea. But uh, yeah, uh, based on the, the, the uh, studies from the, the eastern uh, USA, uh, what Trevor also mentioned is that they sometimes uh, photograph bats, I think around uh, 200 meters high or so. So it, yeah, it is possible that we miss bats because they uh, fly low, fly uh, fly high, or lower, even. Yeah, you mentioned this this new research. What? How high did that is that research suggesting that uh, bats fly over over the water? What's the flight height? Uh, you mean the Swedish uh, research or the the American right. research? The Swedish research. Swe uh, well, that research was done by uh, Allen et al. And mm. they, um, well, what they say is that they mostly fly below 15 meters over sea. Mm -hmm. And, well, from I've seen uh, um, some bats during bird surveys at sea, and these, these also flew quite low between, I don't know, maybe five and 20 meters or so. But, but this, this USA study show, shows that they can also fly uh, enormously high. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, and how long do you plan to continue monitoring at these 12 wind farm locations? Well, this study is running uh, in 2015 and 2016 with possible options for uh, extension during 2017 and further out, but we'll still have to consider the relevance of the data that are not yet elaborated altogether. But it is very likely that we go, we will continue until at least 2017 and 18. Great, great. Um, on what basis do you assume that that's collide with offshore wind turbines is to force uh, an expensive mitigation measure uh, that you were discussing previously. And, and does the presence of the structures 
not serve as a safe haven for uh, the bats, thus allowing more bats to feed, rest, and survive? I'm sorry, I didn't follow exactly what you were uh, asking. Could you rephrase the question, please? Yes. Uh, so um, you mentioned uh, that um, I believe it was uh, Brussel uh, Wind Project that was uh, the first in the world to have bat to be uh, proposing bat mitigation measures. And so um, this question is with regard to that. On one basis, do you assume that bats collide with the wind turbines as to, as to uh, force such a mitigation measure, and does the presence of the structures not serve as a safe haven for bats, allowing them to feed, rest, and survive? Okay, yeah. This, but this mitigation measure, this is a, a precautionary principle, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because uh, now now we know that bats frequently, well, frequently occur at sea uh, during these uh, conditions. Um, well, the government decided that uh, the, 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 the cutting speed uh, should be uh, increased. increased in these periods. So from, mm -hmm. uh, from uh, late August until uh, the end of September. Yeah, but only during the weather conditions that are likely to produce significant movements. If we can find out more precisely what the exact correlation is between the weather conditions and the likelihood of occurring some massive bat migration and more insight into the real proportions of uh, bats that are at risk of, uh, of local populations, like for example the UK population that is likely to cross the, the North Sea, we might be able to uh, to get rid of at least some of the most uh, uh, stressing mitigating measures for the for the wind companies. You know, mm -hmm. um, in, if, if we could uh, with with the same risks for uh, for the bats uh, have a lower cut-in speed. That would be uh, nice for the wind uh, farm uh, operator, of course. And that's one of the reasons to continue investigating in spite of now, for the time being, applying the precautionary principle. Yeah. And it seems that, well, based sure. on the, the preliminary results of the weather analysis, <laughs> it, it seems that they are, in fact, quite predictable, these bats. Yeah? So they're... they're Quite predictable, and, and fortunately for the, the offshore uh, offshore wind industry, uh, they occur during nights with low wind speeds. When you mm. when you lose less uh, money by not uh, having the blades running, if you ha would have more uh, bats and higher winds, you'd lose more money if you had to stop them from running. Right, right. And so do you, um, do any of you know what kind of monitoring is proposed for the site to gauge the effectiveness of these uh, mitigation measures? Well, we have to, we have to uh, get this uh, thermal imaging cameras running because mm -hmm. uh, otherwise it's impossible to, to investigate fatalities at sea. I yeah. mean, you cannot, yeah. uh, I don't know, you cannot train a right. seal to find the uh, fatalities, I think. <laughs> yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's right. Is that the only way to evaluate the effectiveness of the mitigation measure is to really go out and, and look. And mm. you don't see anything at night, so you have to look with... Uh, um, how do they call it? Thermal imaging. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way. That's the only way around. And well, hopefully it will work out because it is a very new technology, and particularly to be applied in offshore conditions. So. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. Very good. Yeah, the work in progress. Right. Um, we don't have any more questions at this time. Um, I guess I'll leave it open for a minute if any other participants want to ask any last questions uh, at this time. 
Well, if we don't have any other questions, I'd like to just um, thank our presenters for um, providing these great presentations today. Uh, it's been very interesting. Um, as Julie mentioned, the recording of this webinar and the presentations will be posted on the REN Hub uh, on TFIS, um and the URL um, will be on the as on this, these slides at the very beginning. Um, we will be having our next quarterly REN webinar in June. We don't have a topic uh, set out quite yet, so if you have any ideas, please send them our way. Uh, our contacts are listed here on the site. Um, Karen Sinclair, Andrea Copping, and Jocelyn Brown uh Feel free to um, send them uh, some webinar ideas if you have any. Um, and with that, again, I'd like to thank the presenters and thank the participants for uh, joining in today.